Good morning, everyone. Today's topic of discussion is cerebrospinal fluid examination. In today's discussion, we are going to see the anatomy and physiology of the CSF in brief, how to collect the CSF specimen, the CSF examination in details. Then we are going to focus on specific types of meningitis. And today we are going to conclude the discussion with the cytology for malignant cells. Anatomy and physiology. So cerebrospinal fluid is the fluid that surrounds the brain and the spinal cord. It is formed in the ventricles by ultrafiltration and secretion through the choroid plexus. It is basically the ultrafiltrate of plasma. The CSF is reabsorbed into the blood through the arachnoid villi of the dural venous sinuses. It is produced at the rate of 500 ml per day. So this is the schematic representation of CSF circulation. These are the lateral ventricles where the CSF is formed. From here, the CSF moves down into the third ventricles, then through the aqueduct of Sylvius into the fourth ventricle. From here, it goes to the subarachnoid space, then into the arachnoid granulation, and finally into the dural venous sinuses. A very little amount of CSF flows into the spinal canal. So let us see what are the functions of CSF. The most important function of CSF is that it protects the brain and the spinal cord from injury by acting as a shock absorber. It also gives physical support to the brain in the way that 1500 gram of brain weighs almost 50 grams when it is suspended in the CSF. It provides the nutrient supply and also performs the excretory rest function, reminding that the CNS does not have lymphatics. It gives protective effect against sudden change in acute venous and arterial pressure and also maintains CNS ionic homeostasis. Now, how is this function important? Because change in certain ions like sodium and potassium can lead to seizures and convulsions. And thus, by maintaining the ionic homeostasis, CSF, CSF protects the brain from it. The normal volume of CSF in adults is 90 to 150 ml, 25% of which lies in the ventricles and the rest lies in the subarachnoid space. In neonates, the normal volume is 10 to 60 ml. As we have seen earlier, earlier that the rate of production of CSF is 500 ml per day and the normal volume ranges from 90 to 150 ml. So accordingly, the total CSF volume is replaced every five to seven hours. This is the normal composition of CSF. Proteins and glucose forms the important constituents of it. In CSF, WBC, normally WBC, we can find zero to 30 WBCs normally in the CSF, ranging from adults to the infants, and the RBCs are not present in normal CSF. Now let's move to another important aspect of CSF and that is the opening pressure. As the name signifies, the opening pressure is measured before withdrawing the CSF from the site. In adults, it is 90 to 180 millimeters of water and in infants and young children, it is 10 to 100 millimeters of water. They attain the adult range at the age of 6 to 8 years. Now, if the CSF opening pressure is more than 250 millimeters of water, it is diagnostic of intracranial hypertension. And if the pressure is more than 200 ml, we should keep in mind that not more than 2 ml of CSF should be collected. In, in patients of meningitis, intracranial hemorrhage, tumors, and congestive heart failure, we see elevated opening pressures. And in patients of spinal and subarachnoid block, dehydration, circulatory collapse, and CSF leakage, there is decreased CSF pressure. Now let's move towards the specimen collection part. The most common method of CSF collection is the lumbar puncture. We can also collect the CSF by lateral cervical puncture and through the ventricular canals or shunt. Now, if the patient comes with the complaint of fever, nausea, vomiting, headache, and neck stiffness, 
that goes towards meningitis. If the patient presents with seizures, convulsions, altered sensorium, then it can be subarachnoid hemorrhage or the presence of tumors. And all these are the indications for lumbar puncture. This is the site. This is the position in which we do the lumbar puncture, lying down and the sitting position. The, position, uh, the site at which we do the lumbar puncture is between L3 and L4 in adults and in between L4 and L5 in infants. We use 20 to 22 gauge lumbar puncture needle for this purpose. Now let's see what is the collection criteria for CSF. The CSF is usually collected in the series of tubes. The tube 1 is for chemistry and immunology studies, tube 2 for microbiology, tube 3 for total cell count and differential count, and tube 4 for cytology and special studies. Now the important points that we should keep in mind while collecting the CSF are that we should avoid glass tubes for collection because that will lead to cell adhesion and hence hamper the cell count. In normal patients with normal opening pressure, we can collect up to 20 ml of CSF. And the specimen that we are collecting for bacterial culture should never be refrigerated because it will not allow the growth of fastidious organisms like Haemophilus influenza and Neisseria meningitis. The diseases that we can detect by CSF examination and having high sensitivity are the bacterial, tuberculosis, and fungal meningitis, also the viral meningitis, subarachnoid hemorrhage, multiple sclerosis, CNS syphilis have high sensitivity. Meningeal malignancies have moderate sensitivity and high specificity. Intracranial hemorrhage, viral encephalitis, subdural hematoma have moderate sensitivity towards CSF examination. Let's see the examination part in detail. When the sample, CSF sample comes to the lab, we should know what is the acceptance criteria. The sample tube should be labeled properly with the name and registration number of the patient, the number of the tube in the series, and the test to be done. There, there must be the requisition form along with it, which should additionally include the site and time of collection, adequate history of the patient, and related investigations done. In case, if any of this information is lacking, we should contact the clinician and take the detailed history and the lacking information. Now, the very important point that we should keep in mind here is that the CSF should be examined within one hour of collection because the cells in the CSF disintegrate rapidly and which can lead to the false low count. Even the glycolysis takes place into the fluid and it leads to the reduction in the glucose levels. Now, first we examine the CSF grossly. Normal CSF is crystal clear, colorless, and its viscosity is similar to that of water. Abnormal CSF can be turbid or cloudy. It can be viscous, pigmented, tinged, or clot formation might be present in the CSF. Now, how do we label if the CSF is clear or it is turbid? Now, we hold the tube of the CSF against the written paper and if we are able to read through the paper, it is clear. And if we are not able to read through the paper, then it is turbid or cloudy, which is seen when the WBC count is more than 200 cells per microliter, RBC count more than 400 cells per microliter. In, ca in cases of presence of microorganisms and aspirated epidural fat, and when the protein levels are more than 150 milligram per deciliter. Some experienced observers and pathologists can detect the cell count less than 50 cells per microliter with the naked eye. And that is possible because of the Tyndall's effect. Here, direct sunlight is directed on the tube at 90 degree angle from the observer. And that will impact a sparkling or snowy appearance as the suspended particles scatter the light. Clot formation can be seen in cases of traumatic taps, complete spinal block, separated or tuberculous meningitis. Now in case of complete spinal block, which can be due to tumors or the abscess formation, 
Then the tumor and the abscess itself exudates and leads to the activation of coagulation pathway, and that leads to the clot formation. Viscous CSF is seen in metastatic mucin-producing adenocarcinomas, in cryptococcal meningitis due to the capsular polysaccharide, and liquid nucleus pulposus when it comes into the CSF due to the needle injury to the annulus fibrosus of the vertebra. Now this is little notorious appearance of CSF that is the pink and red CSF. Pink or red CSF indicates the presence of blood in it. Now grossly bloody CSF is seen when the RBC count is more than 6000 per microliter. Pink CSF can be due to a subarachnoid hemorrhage or due to a traumatic tap. Now how do we differentiate whether it is due to a traumatic puncture or due to a subarachnoid hemorrhage? When the blood is more in the initial tubes as compared to the later tubes, it is due to a traumatic tap. And when the blood is uniform in all the tubes, it is due to subarachnoid hemorrhage. When we centrifuge the CSF and the supernatant is clear, it indicates the traumatic puncture. And if the supernatant is pink or yellow, which is called as xanthochromia, is seen in cases of subarachnoid hemorrhage. On microscopy, we see red cell clumps in traumatic puncture and hemosiderin laden macrophages in subarachnoid hemorrhage, which can also be seen in traumatic puncture if we do delay in CSF due to RBC lysis. CSF pressure and CSF protein is normal in cases of traumatic puncture and it is increased in cases of subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now, Pale pink to yellow color in supernatant of centrifuge CSF is called as xanthochromia. We detect xanthochromia by comparing it with the tube of the distilled, distilled water as shown in the picture. Xanthochromia can range from pink to brown. Now, pink, yellow, and orange xanthochromia is due to the RBC lysis and hemoglobin breakdown products. Pink or orange xanthochromia can be seen due to the release of oxyhemoglobins, which takes place within two to four hours of subarachnoid hemorrhage. And yellow xanthochromia takes place due to the release of bilirubin, which takes place at 12 hours after the release after the subarachnoid hemorrhage. Yellow xanthochromia can additionally be seen in cases of uh, increased CSF proteins that is more than 150 mg per deciliter and in patients of jaundice. Orange xanthochromia can be found in hypervitaminosis A and in cases of rifampicin therapy. Green xanthochromia is due to the bilirubin pigment and the brown is due to the melanin pigment that is seen in meningeal metastatic melanoma. Now let's move towards the microscopic examination part. In microscopic examination, we do the total cell count and the differential count. Total cell count can be done manually on the counting chambers and nowadays the automated cell counters are also available. In manual method, we can use the Neubar's chamber or the Fuchs Rosenthal chamber. The difference between two is that the Neubar's chamber has a depth of 0.1 mm and the Fuchs Rosenthal chamber of 0.2 mm. The Neubar chamber consists of nine large squares and the Fuchs Rosenthal chamber 18 large squares. So whenever the CSF is clear, we can examine it undiluted. And if it is cloudy or turbid, we can use the dilution. And for that purpose, we use normal saline or the turf solution. So when we are counting the WBCs for CSF, we count all the WBCs in all the nine chambers. And then we give the count per cubic millimeter of CSF. Sometimes, due to a traumatic puncture, we get WBCs from the blood are counted in the WBCs of the CSF. At that time, we need to give the corrected WBC count. So, corrected WBC count is observed WBC minus the added WBCs. Now, how do we count this added WBCs? So, added WBCs are WBCs in the peripheral blood count multiplied by the RBCs in the CSF divided by the RBC count in the peripheral blood. Now, these are some conditions in which we get increased cell count, that is meningitis, intracranial hemorrhage, 
malignancies due to repeated lumbar puncture, injection of foreign substances, and demyelinating disorders like multiple sclerosis and Guillain-Barré syndrome. Now, after the total cell count, we do the differential count. For differential count, we centrifuge the sample at 3000 RPM for 10 minutes and the sphere is prepared from the sediment. We fix it with alcohol and stain with Roman Vesky stain and the differential count is given on 100x oil immersion. Now, in normal CSF, we can see small proportion of lymphocytes and mono monocytes in the ratio 70 is to 30. But in young children, there is higher proportion of monocytes, which can be up to 80%. Small proportions of neutrophils can be seen in normal CSF and erythrocytes in cases of trauma. Now, if we again do delay in examination, the neutrophils, neutrophils may be decreased by 68% within two hours of lumbar puncture due to cell lysis. So de doing delay in examination, can alter even the differential count. In cases of traumatic puncture, we can see various types of cells in the CSF. So in this picture, we, we see the choroid plexus cells, which are large cells with uh, abundant cytoplasm, large round to oval nucleus and dispersed chromatin. These are the blast cells, which, are, uh, which come from the bone marrow of the premature infants. Now let's see one by one the increase in specific type of inflammatory cells. We see increased CSF neutrophils in early bacterial meningitis that is more than up to 60%. And if the total cell count is more than 1180 per microliter, it gives 99% predictive value that it is a bacterial meningitis. Increase in neutrophils can also be seen in early viral meningitis but it changes to lymphocytic pleos uh, pleocytosis within two to three days. The lymphocytes are specifically increased in viral, tuberculous and fungal meningitis and even in cases of early bacterial meningitis, but here the total leukocyte count is less than 1000 per microliter. So these are some conditions in which we see increased CSF neutrophils as we have seen the bacterial meningitis early viral meningitis, in cases of cerebral abscess, subarachnoid and intracerebral hemorrhages. And the lymphocytosis is seen in viral tuberculous and fungal meningitis, early bacterial meningitis, and degenerative disorders like multiple sclerosis, Guillain-Barré syndrome, subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. Increased plasma cells can be seen in variety of inflammatory and infectious conditions which are seen along with the large and small lymphocytes and even in cases of CNS tumors. There is this condition, multiple myeloma, which is rarely detected in the CSF. But when we detect it in CSF, we find increased amount of plasma cells. Eosinophils in a mild range that is 1 to 4% can be seen in general inflammatory response. But for labeling it as eosinophilic meningitis, more than 10% of eosinophils must be present. Angiostrongylus pontonensis is the most common cause of eosinophilic meningitis. Even coxidoidus emitus is a significant cause and it is an endemic in the United States. In cases of parasitic infec infection of the CNS, we can also get increased CSF eosinophils. Now let's see the chemical analysis. The proteins are increased in cases of meningitis, spinal cord tumor, multiple sclerosis, Guillain-Barré syndrome, and hemorrhage. Specifically, IgG is increased in cases of multiple sclerosis, neurosyphilis, and subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. The glucose is reduced in all types of meningitis that is bacterial, tuberculous, and fungal, but it is normal in cases of viral meningitis. We also do the microbiological examination of CSF. Here, we do the direct wet mount of CSF if we are suspecting cryptococcus, toxoplasma, amoebic uh, infection, or, uh, or sometimes if we are suspecting the candida. 
gram smear is done if we get increased neutrophilic count zn smear for detecting mycobacteria tuberculosis latex agglutination test to detect some viral and cryptococcal antigens serologic test for syphilis such as vdrl is done culture for bacteria fungi and yeast is done in uh, is can be done here and polymer polymerase chain reaction for detecting the viruses now let's see the specific types of meningitis one by one acute bacterial meningitis is caused by various organisms some of which are neisseria meningitidis hemophilus influenza streptococcus pneumoniae listeria monocytogens here we see numerous neutrophils on the smears and bacteria may or may not be seen it is very important to diagnose acute bacterial meningitis because if not treated it can turn very fatal aseptic meningitis is actually is actually a misnomer because it is caused by wide range of infectious pathogen the most common pathogen which causes aseptic meningitis is enterovirus like non paralytic polio viruses coxsackie viruses eco virus etc now in aseptic meningitis we see increased lymphocytes and monocytes and also small proportion of atypical lymphocytes as we can see here cryptococcal meningitis is caused by cryptococcus neoformans and it shows variable degree of inflammatory response so this is the papaniculos stain uh, done for cryptococcus here the organism here we can see the organism with mucopolysaccharide -poly capsule and thin necked budding it can also be cup shaped trapping the air inside it and showing the refractile artifact this is the india ink preparation showing the cryptococcus neoformans toxoplasmosis caused by toxoplasma fungi here we see numerous neutrophils on the smear and very small uh, crescent shaped tachyzoids with small round to oval nucleus now let us summarize the different types of meningitis turbid or cloudy csf is seen in cases of bacterial and fungal meningitis and we can have clear cloudy csf in cases of viral and tuberculosis the cell count is markedly increased in bacterial meningitis whether it, and it is less than 100 per microliter in cases of viral meningitis in bacterial meningitis we, we predominantly see neutrophils and lymphocytosis in viral fungal and tuberculosis meningitis proteins are increased in all cases of meningitis glucose is decreased in all cases of meningitis but it is normal in viral meningitis now after this let's move towards the cytology of csf for malignant cells at least one ml sample should be collected for the purpose of cytology it is cytocentrifuge and both air dried and alcohol fixed smears are prepared metastasis is more common than the primary cns tumors the most common carcinoma which metastasizes to the csf is the lung carcinoma and among that the adenocarcinoma variant is most common here we see the csf picture showing the adenocarcinoma cells the cells are large uh, with abundant cytoplasm eccentrically placed nucleus and prominent nucleoli if the small cell carcinoma can be detected in the csf here the cells are comparatively small and we can see the prominent nuclear molding over here followed by lung carcinoma breast carcinoma can also metastasize to the csf this is the picture of the duct carcinoma cells into the csf these are large round to oval cells with very scant cytoplasm large round nucleus with prominent nucleoli this is the picture of the lobular carcinoma into the csf here the cells are uh, relatively medium sized and semi lunar to round to oval nucleus is seen a melanoma can be the metastasis from the primary site like skin or it can arise primarily from leptomeninges in the cases of melanosis cerebri here the leptomenin uh, there is 
melanocytes are present in the leptomeninges which gives rise to the melanoma in this picture we see the melanoma cells which are large cells with a big nucleus and prominent nucleoli the melanin pigment may or may not be seen amongst the leukemias all most commonly disseminates into the csf all the three morphological types of all that is l1 l2 and l3 can be detected in the csf and their morphology is similar to that we see in the peripheral smear and the bone marrow aml is relatively less common to to be disseminated into the csf and amongst that m4 variant is common commonly detected in the csf malignant lymphoma non hodgkin's lymphoma is most common uh, commonly disseminated into the csf diffuse large b cell lymphoma lymphoblastic lymphoma and burkitt's lymphoma has higher affinity towards cns and we should keep in mind that hodgkin's lymphoma and small lymphocytic lymphoma are never seen in csf now let's move towards the primary cns malignancies primary cns malignancies can be disseminated into the csf by the hematogenous spread or by the direct extensions medulloblastoma is the most common malignancy that can be uh, detected in the csf followed by ependymoma germ cell tumors astrocytoma glioblastoma pineoblastoma primary cns lymphomas or typical teratoid or rhabdoid tumors so this is the picture of csf showing the medu a small round cell tumor with prominent nuclear molding and that is the medulloblastoma here we see the ependymoma cells in the csf which are cuboidal to columnar cells cells with round to oval nucleus and prominent nucleoli these are the malignant germ cell tumor cells which are large cells with higher nucleocytoplasmic ratio and prominent nucleoli this is the picture of a typical teratoid or haploid tumor where the large cytoplasmic body pushes the nucleus towards the periphery and we see the prominent nucleoli this is the picture of cns lymphoma where we see atypical lymphocytes along with some normal lymphocytes as we can see here the atypical lymphocytes are large with higher nucleocytoplasmic ratio and dispersed chromatin this picture shows the choroid plexus papilloma where we can see the clusters of atypical choroid plexus cells so this was all about today's discussion of csf examination these are my references thank you any questions from the online faculty in case of meningitis when you get uh, csf what is the uh, cut off point for leukocytes when you do manual count what is the cut off point above which you will call it meningitis in case of bacterial meningitis what which cells and how many in case of uh, tuberculous meningitis which cells and how many ma'am uh, tlc we get up to 5 normally but even if one neutrophil is present then it is suggestive of bacterial meningitis right. even a single neutrophil is abnormal and more than 5 lymphocytes are abnormal okay the presentation was extremely good quite nice very very interesting to see the good presentation